let's talk about uh, Johnny, Johnny Ashcraft because it was his legal case that actually went all the way to the Supreme Court. That's right. And, and, and led to a legal precedent uh, yes. out of his case. Johnny Ashcraft was a drag line operator in, uh, in Memphis and um, one night his wife disappeared and she was found in a ditch off the, the Raleigh Road and she was murdered, she had been murdered. Well, the police department and the sheriff's department both uh, quickly determined that Ashcraft was guilty. So they arrested him, uh, took him to um, a, one, a room in the Shelby County Jail and began to question him, to interrogate him. And uh, they used uh, coercive methods uh, what, what we sometimes see in the movies is the third degree, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, under a bare bulb and yelling and screaming, well you, well, you know you did this, you know, whatever. And they refused to allow him to sleep or eat for 36 hours. And uh, at the end of that 36 hours, they came to him and said, we've got a confession we want you to sign. And he said, I didn't make this confession. I'm not signing this. They charged him with murder anyway, tried to introduce the, uh, uh, the confession into, um, into the court record. He was found guilty and the case he appealed. He was, and, wait a minute, he was found uh, guilty even though he didn't sign the confession? That's right, that's right. He's found guilty okay. anyway, pretty quickly in 1941. Uh, so he's found guilty, he appeals, and it eventually makes its way to the uh, Tennessee Supreme Court, then the U.S. Supreme Court. The case is decided in 1944, and uh, the opinion is written by Justice Hugo Black, who, uh, for those who know about the Supreme Court, was um, one of the most liberal members of the court, a uh, strong believer in civil liberties. And uh, he makes it clear in his decision, which is agreed upon by the rest of the court, uh, although there is a minority, there is a, um, uh, an opinion that disagrees with his, but um, that the police cannot coerce confessions out of people. They cannot keep people for 36 hours without the basic necessities of life uh, and then expect them to be able to tell the truth at the end of that time. And he says very clearly, there are other governments in this world who have police who break down people's doors in the middle of the night, haul them into um, a police building and find them guilty very quickly and execute them. We don't do that in America. That's against the Constitution. As long as the Constitution governs this land, then that is unconstitutional. And, uh, and of course, this, this changes uh, how police deal with suspects. Uh, across the country. I mean, it, it, uh, if, uh, many of the people who are watching this probably have watched Law and Order and, <laughs> and uh, other police procedurals. You know, and you'll see things, well, we can only keep this, we only keep him for 72 hours, or we can't detain him for 36 hours, whatever, whatever the number is. And there are other things they can't do because they're illegal. And the Ashcraft case, is the foundation of all of those things. So the next time folks watch one of those things and hear something like that, remember that it came out of Memphis. And it was the first case, first U.S. Supreme Court case to come out of Memphis. And so um, uh, a very important foundation for our civil liberties. And it, it leads to other precedents because That's Miranda exactly, follows. And Miranda follows maybe a, a, decade, a, or so. a decade or so yeah. later. Yeah. And, um, you know, this question of how far can law enforcement go in the fulfillment of their duty? And um, there's, of course, differences of opinion on that, but it's the courts ultimately that, de that decide. And the courts have uh, uh, consistently upheld Ashcraft as being, um, you know, a very important foundation for, um, you know, uh, keeping track of, of police, um, police procedures. When you sent me this next story, I, I was a little surprised because I guess I never connected Memphis with communism. Right. But in fact, there were communists in Memphis. There were. Um, the first communists that we have a record of um, were in the early 1930s. And let's keep in mind what's going on at this time. This is the Great Depression. 
thousands of people out of work, um, even larger numbers of people who are destitute. And of course, people are looking for any answer in the early 1930s. Um, and communism is, is one of those answers. Right, Workers uh, of the World Unite sounds pretty good. Yeah, it does indeed when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you've been lost your job and can't find another. And so in 1932, uh, three communist agitators come to town and they hold a meeting in um, a home on Breedlove. And they advertise it as just, you know, uh, need unemployment assistance? Come to this meeting. So about 25, 26 Memphians go to this meeting and they're sitting there and all of a sudden they start talking about communism and they're, the, the Memphians are rather bewildered about all this. And all of a sudden the police bust in and um, a riot squad comes in and the three communists jump out of the windows and flee. But uh, that's the first indication that we have or first evidence we have of communist sort of activity in Memphis. Um, that same year, 1932, later that year, uh, there were two communists who ran for local office. There was a man named Ollie Overton, not, no relation to- Not that Overton. Not that Overton, okay. no. Uh, who ran for Congress against uh, Mr. E.H. Crump. He didn't succeed. Uh, unsuccessfully. Yes, sure. unsuccessfully. Yes. And then a man named G.B. Adams who ran for, um, ran for sheriff, for Shelby County Sheriff. Now, we don't know really anything about Overton, but uh, Adams had been a uh, woodworker and he had worked in a factory making uh, ax handles and uh, the depression devastated uh, that local econ that economy and he was down to working one day a week and so he turned to communism because he felt that capitalism was not doing him any good and uh, he was unsuccessful as well but uh, there were small cells of communists who operated through the 30s and 40s not uh, not a lot of activities like we saw in the early 30s but it sort of reemerges in the 1950s, and in 1954, there was a very important uh, case that uh, uh, took place in Memphis. Uh, there was a man named Junius Scales, and Scales was uh, the leader of uh, the region, regional communist cells in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. And he came, he visited Memphis often. And uh, one day he is standing out in front of um, the Methodist Church on Union when uh, a couple of FBI men come and arrest him. They had been tracking him for some time. And um, uh, it was raining that night and he was standing there in an umbrella and all of a sudden two men come and, and pick him up. And, and Junius Scales is, uh, becomes a very important case uh, in terms of uh, uh, communism. He reveals a lot of information about how he has been, how he got involved with communism, how he rose through the ranks to become sort of a regional director of, of communist uh, organizations. And um, uh, mo more importantly, he is charged under a federal law called the Smith Act. And the Smith Act was a law that had been passed several years before 1954 that made it illegal for an American citizen to be a member of an organization that uh, vowed to overthrow the federal government. Now the Smith Act was never really challenged in court, so it's, it's, it, but it was always questionable whether it was actually constitutional or not. And Scales is the only person who was ever arrested and, and charged and convicted of the Smith Act. And he was sent to federal prison, sentenced to like 10 years in prison. And uh, it's interesting because uh, the Scales case becomes uh, sort of a cause celeb amongst the left wing and, and liberal and democratic party elements in the, in the country who see it as an unjust situation. And uh, one person who was influenced by the Scales case was the uh, Attorney General of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy. And uh, he looked over the case because there were people who were constantly saying, you know, he needs to be let out of jail. This is wrong. He shouldn't be put in jail for his political beliefs. We don't do that in America. 
and uh, Kennedy investigated the case in the early 1960s and he convinced his brother, in, uh, President John Kennedy, in 1962 to commute his sentence and he was released. So, um, and after, after Scales um, was uh, captured here, the, uh, the communist movement, which was extremely small in Memphis, collapsed. Uh, in 1957, uh, Mississippi Senator James Eastland had a, um, a Senate committee investigating subversive groups. And he held a meeting, he held hearings in Memphis in 1957. And the only thing they could uncover were two Marxists who had left the party years before. So uh, big splash in the newspapers, no communists in Memphis, you know, and. Because Scales was, a, was an idealistic young man. He didn't understand, I don't think, the role he may have been playing in, in, uh, in Soviet plans. And, um, but, uh, but, it's, but it's fascinating to think that here in the South, which has been traditionally so anti-communist, and understandably so, um, that we had these cells operating here, and I think most Memphians um, would be surprised to learn that. And, and, uh, but it is fascinating, it shows us the reach of sort of communist or organizations and how, it, uh, how people turn to it in, in times of need. Well, often history is stranger than fiction. That's right. So. I, when I was growing up, uh, my parents would bring me to the Mid-South Fair mm -hmm. every year. Yeah. And like clockwork, we would go through the cattle barn, mm -hmm. see all of the cattle, all mm -hmm. of the animals. Yes. You've got an interesting saga about the cattle barn. Well, the cattle barn, you would think that of all the things that we could talk about, uh, a, an agricultural building at a fairground <laughs> right. would not make the list, right? No, no, it wouldn't cause an up uh, an uproar. In That's any way, right. right. But it, in, in reality, it did. Uh, in the early 1950s, the cattle barn was being expanded, and uh, they hired um, a um, an iron company in town to 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 build an addition to it and expand it. And they subcontracted to a uh, an iron, uh, another iron company, a steel co iron company in Dyersburg. The Dyersburg Company did not hire union workers. Well, Memphis has a, had a very strong skilled labor movement, not a lot of unskilled labor organized here, but skilled labor, very powerful, uh, politically influential, uh, large numbers of Memph Memphians belonging to these uh, unions, including the Iron Workers Union. So they're rather upset that non-union workers are working on this project, particularly because it's a city project and the city has long-standing agreements with, uh, they may be unofficial agreements, but nevertheless understandings that the city of Memphis will hire only union workers. Um, so they go out to, uh, to talk to, uh, the non-union workers at the fairgrounds one day. And uh, they're, they bring with them such negotiating tools as <laughs> bats and um, um, other handheld weapons. This doesn't weapons. sound like a friendly talk. No, it's not it's intended. Not no, it is no. not. In fact, the intention is to intimidate them into hiring union workers. Well, uh, the non-union workers pick up pieces of iron, they're iron workers after all, and they start throwing them at these guys and um, attacking some of them and they go away. But the next day, they come back and this time they're armed with pistols. Well, the non-union workers are also armed with pistols because they'd got roughed up the day before too and didn't want it to, didn't want it to happen again. So as soon as they stepped out of the car, uh, the non-union workers started firing on the union workers. So there was like a gunfight there was at a the cattle gun, There barn. was a gunfight at the cattle the okay barn. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Several men were wounded. Fortunately, nobody was killed. And of course, the police swooped down. They arrest everybody who's standing around. <laughs> and uh, you know, they go to court, and uh, they're fi the the they are able to identify several of the people whom they believe were involved in uh, the actual violence. They are um, charged with uh, 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 malicious mischief and mayhem and found guilty. Uh, the city uh, 
you know, goes down and, and tries to negotiate some sort of an agreement. There really isn't an agreement that, that takes place, but uh, no one is really satisfied. But the cattle barn gets built or gets, gets renovated. And, uh, but then a couple of months later, a, uh, the following year, uh, right after it's finished, it's finished in the spring of 1955, and uh, there are a group of uh, girls who are attending Fairview Junior High. And one day they go downtown and watch the movie Blackboard Jungle. And for those who don't know, the Blackboard Jungle is the story of a, of a sort of idealistic teacher that goes into a quote unquote slum area and is teaching poor kids, and these kids are violent, many of them. Um, uh, back then they were called juvenile delinquents. And uh, so they see this movie and they're just, they're just enthralled by this culture that is so far removed from what they live. And they wanna be cool like the kids in the Blackboard Jungle. So a, a, a small group of them form their own gang a, a girl gang. Uh, a girl gang, okay. and they call themselves the Corpus Debs, um, <laughs> just unusual name. Uh, you would think, you know, the Jets or the, yeah, or something, you know, something like that. Something like that. with a little. Uh, yeah, but um, uh, they have a, a, a list of bylaws where they say, you know, uh, don't squeal if the cops pick you up and this <laughs> sort of thing. And so um, they decide to be cool, and they set the cattle barn on fire. After it's just been after it's just been built, <sighs> amazing, and uh, it's um, uh, pretty much burned to the ground, except of course for the iron. That was, <laughs> for was the iron right, yes, well. and um, and so the the uh, the be the frame is is survives. It's just the wood and everything that uh, the young women are uh, quickly arrested, <laughs> and they forget about their vow not to squeal and explain to the police what they were doing and they were put on trial and found guilty of um, of um, um, of burning of, of arson and sent to the uh, the juvenile court and sent to a facility you know one thing that that I think is very good that that should be brought out is the newspaper stories do not mention these young ladies' names, so we don't know who they were, which is a good thing because they shouldn't have to spend the rest of their <laughs> no, lives. With that black you know, mark that's right. Exactly, yes, yes. exactly. They were just dumb kids who made yeah. a mistake, and and fortunately, no one was hurt. It would have been different, perhaps, if someone had been hurt. But, uh, but yeah, but but they they quickly uh, rebuilt, and it was it was open for the 1955 Mid South Fair in September. And of course, it continued until 2008, when when the fair right. moved. Yep. And and I, like you, I went to the the cattle barn all the time. And and uh, in fact, uh, the cattle barn is where we would have one of the places we'd have our Boy Scout show every year. And we used to do cooking demonstrations <laughs> in there. So uh, so yeah, uh, it, you know, the the fairgrounds was a very important part of the culture of Memphis. And um, it survived a Union riot but couldn't survive the corpus dibs. That's right, <laughs> that's exactly right. right. Let's move on to uh, another story. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is about a, a gentleman who is really a, a major, a significant name right. in gospel music, not just here in Memphis, but uh, nationwide, that's, Oris Mays. That's right, Oris Mays. One, one thing that when we talk about Memphis music, too often we forget that uh, Memphis has also been a strong leader in gospel music as well as other forms of music. There have been significant uh, composers and one of them was Oris Mays. Oris Mays was a, um, uh, the pastor of a local church who uh, loved gospel music. In fact, he really sort of started his career, um, he wanted to be a gospel singer. He didn't want to be a preacher. In fact, he sort of rejected that part of, of, of that life uh, until uh, he would say later that, you know, he was, he, he was called to become a preacher, to do more than simply sing about the gospel, but also to teach it. So um, uh, he goes to seminary, becomes a preacher, but he's still very involved in music. And he composes several uh, gospel songs. And um, in 1966, he is um, he's given the opportunity to host his own television show on uh, WMC Channel 5. And it would come on Sunday mornings and it was on for, for several decades. 
and it would come on. Uh, I remember it as a matter of fact. <laughs> I do too. Because uh, it would come on before Magic before Land. Before Magic Land. And so yes. <laughs> I would, you know, I was far more interested in Mr. Magic than <laughs> right, I was exactly. Horace Mays. But he introduced so many people to that style of music, and um, had an impact on a lot of people's lives. He he said um, towards the end of his his life, uh, he said, you know, because of the TV show which was shown in, in other parts of the country. It was syndicated. Other local television stations would broadcast it as well, up in, mostly in the Midwest, a little bit in the North. And he would get letters from people all over the country saying, I heard you, uh, saw your show, and um, would tell them about some problem they had, some, something they were struggling with. And uh, he would always write them back he would always offer any advice or comfort that he could. And he used that music to make people's lives better. And he said, you know, if, if you're not helping somebody, you're not, you, you, you don't have a job. You're not doing anything for this world. And uh, so he saw the show as, a, um, uh, as an extension of his ministry. But it was more than that. Uh, it uh, strengthened Memphis's uh, place as a musical center. It obviously inspired hundreds of people to, to perform that music and buy those records and listen on the radio. And um, uh, so it's very important, not to mention the lives that were impacted by the music and his show and yeah. Well, we always think that Memphis, you know, has such a rock and roll history. That's right. But we have an incredibly strong gospel music history. We do as well. indeed. I mean, uh, Mays belongs up there with other uh, gospel composers who perhaps are slightly more well known: Lucy Campbell, uh, Herbert Brewster, Olanda Draper, uh, as well as others. Those th those are three that I think most people who know anything about. Uh, or have just been around Memphis for a long time. I've heard those names. And at one time you heard Oris Mays more than any of the others because of his television show. Um, his, um, he's been forgotten a little bit, but uh, uh, not in the hearts of many people who heard that show, watched that show. And he lives on. And he does it with, with the songs he composed and uh, the recordings that he made. Well, Wayne, this is fascinating. Thank you for being on Thank the show. I, I love to hear about uh, the history that we don't know. Yeah. It just proves that history is often stranger than fiction. It is indeed, and um, uh, history happens to people, and uh, people, there are all kinds of people in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you.